God, I don't know who came here this morning, but God is about to speak to somebody very loud and clear. Very loud. I'm going to tell you how loud it is. Usually preachers don't tell you this when it happens. But I... (laughs) Oh, God is good. It is... It is... So much God wants to speak to you that... And we're going to get to the sermon here in a second. But... I don't even have the sermon uploaded up here. And God told me this morning uh, when I was praying that God was going to speak. There was going to be a free flow of his word. And so, so I don't know who you are. You came to church. You're looking for answers. You're looking for something new to happen in your life. And God is going to speak to you with authority. And when he speaks to you, you got to have your heart ready to receive what he has for you. you got to have a heart that says, God, I, I want to hear from you. I need to hear from you. It's no as to what God is going to speak to you. And do not say to your neighbor, if you're new here today, do not say to your neighbor, did you tell the pastor something? Because I was not even in New York City this week. I want to talk to you today, and the message of today's message is, it's up to you. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor! It is up to you. Touch at least three people and tell them it's up to you. A lot of times we're waiting on God. But God says, I did my part and it is up to you. So often, we're just waiting, and God is waiting on you. And so you're waiting for something to happen, and God is saying to you, I'm waiting for you to make it happen. And as long as you're waiting for God to make his move, when God is saying, I'm waiting for you to make your move. Because when you make your move, I'm going to make my move. When you activate, I'm going to activate. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, activate. And this is what happened to Israel. Israel was waiting for the king to come and overthrow the, the Roman Empire. They were waiting for a king. They were waiting for God. To make his move and sandblast the Roman Empire. But God was waiting on them. Because it was up to them to make the move. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19 verse 41. And when he approached Jerusalem. He saw the city and went over it. Saying if you had known on this day. Even you. The conditions for peace. But now it has been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will put up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you on every side. And they will level you to the ground and throw throw down your children within you. And they will not leave you, live in you one stone upon another. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And Jesus entered the temple ground and began to drive out those who were selling. 
Here comes Jesus. He's coming in triumphal entry. It was Palm Sunday as we call it. And it's called Palm Sunday because they took palms uh, and they began to put them uh, in front uh, of the donkey that he was riding. They were even putting their coats down. Uh, they were putting uh, the, the garments down. They were giving him a royal, They were, uh, as we would say today, red carpet for the king to come. But when Jesus come, he he he's trouble. He, he and, and 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 yet even the Pharisees, the very religious people that you have known, that this is the time that the king was coming, so they could be free, amen, from everything that they're struggling with, from their from their sin, or from their bondages, from everything that the enemy wanted to bring them down, they didn't get it, they missed the time of his visitation. So Jesus began to say to them, "There's something wrong here." and you have to make room. I'm here to tell you the first thing that God is saying to you this morning is that you got to make room for me. See, this is not the first time that Jesus goes up to the temple and he begins to Overthrow, the Bible says in John chapter 2, verse 13 through 16, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went out to Jerusalem within the temple grounds. He found those who were selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and money changers seated at their table, and he took a whip, a car, and man, he started overthrowing the temple, uh, the, the tables of, of, of this transaction that was happening in the house of God. So it happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, three years, three and a half years before. And here, a week before Jesus was to be crucified, just a few days before he was to be crucified, we see Jesus, and he goes, and he does the same thing after he goes through this parade. And, 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 and what was happening was that they came and they took over. You see, the temple was set up, a holies of holy. Just imagine a, a, a room where there was the holies of holies. Only one person could go there once a year, and that was the high priest. It was such a holy place that whenever the high priest would go there, they would put a rope around his ankle in case that he was in right with God. And if God was struck him dead, imagine what would happen. What would have happened? Well, who would, who would dare to go in there to get him out? So they put a rope around him so they could drag him out. In case if he didn't come out, they will drag him out. And, and, and so that, that was the holy so holy. Then you had the holy place. And then you had, uh, you had the outer court where you had the courts of men. Then you had the courts of women. And then far away. As a matter of fact, if you go to the museum of Jerusalem, uh, of Israel, I've been there. They have, and I told the tour guide, I said, I bet you you didn't realize this. What we're seeing here right now is the closest thing that we know for a fact was the closest to the temple. They had a, they, they, they have it up to this day. They had a, a stone and engraved, and it says, if you basically, if you were not a, a uh, uh, in, in the covenant of being Jewish and you pass over, the sentence was death. They, they have that. They found that. So in, in the outer, uh, way out there, we had the outer core for the Gentiles. And that place was supposed to be the place where people who were not the people of God, but they were seekers of God. They were called God fears. They feared God. They knew that there was more. They knew that what they had in life was not enough. They knew that the idols were false idols. They knew that, that the world did not. The same issues that we were dealing with today is the same issues that the Gentiles were dealing with. So they would go there so they could seek God. And, and so, but what they did was they began to sell. There was nothing wrong with the selling of the stuff that they were selling because during that time, if you came from a land far away, you, you, you wouldn't carry those animals that you were going to sacrifice in the temple because it would be too far and to be honest with you, too costly. So what they did, they would bring money and when they got there, 
they will, they will buy fr from them. But the thing is that they end up doing the selling in the courts of the Gentile and the space where the Gentiles were supposed to seek God, that space got occupied and they crowded out the Lord out of there. They crowded out what God wanted to do in order for people to seek God. Isn't that the problem that we have in the church in America today? The problem that we have it is that we have everything else in the the church except his presence and set the place where we can see the face of God. Can somebody say amen? This is the most prayerless generation I believe in the history of the United States of America. This nation was founded with people who sought the Lord. But I want to give you some good news. Because let me tell you what Jesus did. When he died upon the cross, the very moment that he died upon the cross, there, there was a veil that was about this thick between the holy place and the holies of holy. And the moment that he died, there was a mighty earthquake. And from the top to the bottom, God went like this. He went, he ripped it. I'm here to tell you that God is about to rip. If you make room for God, he's about to rip what stood between the presence of the Lord. Do I have anybody who's ready to enter into a new level? Presence of God. You're ready to say, I want more. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I want more. I want more of his presence. I want more of his power. I want more of his anointing. I want more of his heart. I, I more, want more of the, of the workings of God. I want God. I want God. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I can't live without Jesus. I got to have Jesus. I had enough of religion. I had enough of tradition. I had enough of the do's and don'ts. I want Jesus. Do I have anybody here who wants Jesus? Let's make room for Jesus. I know it's tough and you gotta make room for Jesus I know the devil is coming against you but you got to make room for Jesus there's a TV show that I cannot watch I'm not watching TV nowadays but there's a TV show that if I were to watch TV I just can watch that TV show it's called Hoarders. <laughs> How many of you are like me? I, I can't watch that. How, I, do I have anybody think? think I, I thought it was just me. It, it gives me anxiety. It's like I feel like I'm there. I feel like if I were to, it's like, oh, oh my God, I don't want to touch that. How long has that been there? How long has that plate of food been there? What's, what's behind there? Is there a little mouse? Is there a family of Mickey Mouse in there? I, 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 God, no, I just I, I feel like it's trying to. And can I tell you this? That's the same thing that is happening spiritually to people. They're hoarding everything else and they're not making room for Jesus. I don't know about you, but it's time to make room for Jesus. It's time to move everything. Come on, box it all up, get it out. Turn to your neighbor, tell them, get it out. Get the garbage out. You got to get all the garbage. Get the garbage. You got to get the garbage. It's been there too long. It's petrified. It's, uh, it's clutter. You got to get the clutter out. You got to get all the spiritual clutter out. And you got to make room for Jesus. Make room for Jesus. This is the greatest moment of your life. The greatest days are about to be unleashed in your life. The greatest blessings are about to come. The greatest breakthroughs are about to come. The greatest miracles you have ever seen in your life is about to happen. The greatest healings are about to happen. Your family is going to get saved. Breakthrough is going to happen. Doors are going to open. I feel like somebody is about to step 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 into another realm of what God has for them do I have anybody here today who is ready to make room for God you need to burst loose of whatever is trying to hold you back you need to burst loose and say get out of the way get out of the way I'm about to make room out 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 
out. You don't belong here. This is the place for Jesus. And if you believe that, give a shout to Jesus. You got to make room for Jesus. Make room for Jesus. Here's the second thing you got to do. Oh, glory to God. Oh, it's good to preach with our notes. I have to say one more thing. I have to say one more thing. God knows what's in the house. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 8 through 9 and 14. The Bible says that God told the prophet, go and see the wicked abominations that they're doing here. So I enter and I look and behold every form of crawling things and animal and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel carved on the wall all around. And standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel with Yasaniah, the son of Saphon, standing among them. Each man with the censer in his hand and the fragrance of cloud of incense was rising. Then he said to me, do you see, son of man, what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark? Each man in the rooms of these carved images. For they said, watch this, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has abandoned the land. And he said to me, yet you will see greater abominations what they are committing. He says, I want you to look through this little hole. They do any hidden. Oh, can I talk to you about secrets? Secrets. Mm. It's the little foxes, the Bible says, that spoil the vine. It's the little things that nobody sees, but God sees. It's the little things that nobody sees and nobody notices, nobody's paying attention, but you know. You know your TikTok. You blame it on TikTok. Oh, they're showing all these things are showing up. Pastor, I don't understand. The algorithm, ooh, this is about to get heavy. The algorithm is following whatever you're following. And this is about to get heavy. The algorithm of heaven, boom, is following whatever you're following. So if you're following holiness, if you're following righteousness, if you're following joy in the law, if you're following the peace of God, if you're following harmony, I'm here to tell you that he will follow you. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow I feel that new spiritual algorithm is about to be unleashed in your life because you are about to make room for God. You are about to break uh, the oh, you're about to break uh, the idols in your life. There was a prophet, there was a prophet that he came to the king and they had oh the Bible came down. I feel that somebody here is about to activate the prophetic authority in the life. They're going to walk and wherever they walk, idols are coming down. Powers and principalities are about to come down. Wherever they walk, the walking morals, powers and principalities are going to be cast down. Or wherever they're going in Grand Concord and the supermarket, doesn't matter they walk in the school. Young people, when you walk in the school, you're going to walk with a power and authority, a prophetic authority, and the idols shall be crushed. Do you feel like I feel? Something is about to break loose in this place something is about to activate inside of you make room for God watch this some of you some of you listen 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 Linda listen Linda listen Peter I want you I want you to understand this a lot of times I say, God, I want to prophesy like that. God, I want to lay hands on the sick. Lord, I want to. And you're waiting for this thing. And you don't realize that all spiritual blessings are already inside of you. The Holy Spirit inside of you. All you got to do is activate it. But you got to make room for God to move. Can somebody say amen? 
You got to make room for the divine flow to flow through your life. Now I could get to point number two. You heard me speak about this since January 1st, but I want to go in deeper. You got to make an effective prayer altar. Let me show you how important this prayer altar in your life is. The Bible says, and he said to them, here he come. He came in triumphal entry. They all shout and Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you see glory to God. Uh, uh, you, you see uh, all kinds of uh, uh, manifestations, amen, of that God is doing. As a matter of fact, if you read in the book of Luke and the other, the other gospel, he began to, to, to pray. Uh, and, he, and people would got to get healed. You know Why? Because when you make an effective altar, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it right now. When you make it, you become, when you become a house of prayer. As a matter of fact, let's read it. He says, it is written. Can somebody say, it is written. My house will be called a house of prayer. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. When you become a house of prayer. Then you become a house of power. You become a house of purity. You become a house of his presence. You become a house of his promise. You become a house, listen, of, of, of the proximity of God becomes closer and closer to you. House of prayer. Now, most people when they hear we should be called a house of prayer, we think like this. Oh, that's that's. That's the title. It is not a title. It's an action. Amen. Oh, we're a house of prayer. And people say, we're a house of prayer, but they don't pray. Yep. By the way, the house is not talking about this building. It's not talking about churches, sanctuaries rather. It's not talking about temple sanctuary. It's talking about the people of God. The Bible says that we are the living stone. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple. You are the house of God. And out of this house of God shall come a corporate house of prayer. Because the greater shall bless the lesser. You see, when you get plugged in to the greater, when you get plugged into the greater corporate house of prayer, what ends up happening is that all of a sudden, the blessing that is upon the church. Listen, God never promised that he will. Let me take that back. Let, let me rephrase it. The only institution that God has blessed to last for all of eternity is his church. Not even your family because you're not going to be married when you get to heaven. And some of you are saying, thank God, hallelujah. <laughs> Hopefully not because God might make your wife your neighbor, hallelujah. <laughs> In heaven, the Bible says that we're like angels. We're not given into marriage. You're not going to be an angel, but you're not given into marriage. It, the moment that you die, that covenant ceases to exist. But the only covenant that lasts forever is the covenant that God made with his church. And so, so what you got to understand is that God has put an immense blessing upon the church. So when the church is praying together and is gathering together, it becomes the most powerful, effective altar in the entire region. It literally, listen to me, no darkness is able to stop what God is doing. As a matter of fact, all of a sudden, you begin to attract you begin to attract the activity of God upon the church. Yesterday, a friend of mine, Bishop Fernando Rodriguez, he had a, a prophetess in his church. They were doing a, a session. He sent me this. <laughs> God, is, God is something. He, he never ceased to blow me away. I've been a Christian for 42 years. I've seen a lot. And this prophetess said to Bishop Fernando Rodriguez, Bishop, you have a friend. 
We're very close. Very, very close. And he says, his name is Fernando Cabrera. I never met this lady. He's never mentioned me to her at all. And his name is Fernando Cabrera. I'm about to unleash. I'm about to let loose a new dimension. And, he's, and she said, and there will be three works of God that is going to happen. Uh, a new life. She described the church. She says the church went like this. She goes, the church has the sign that says new life outside. It has glasses outside. When you walk in, there's columns, white columns that they're around. And the outer is painted black. Come on, somebody. When, we, when the church comes together to pray. Let me tell you what happens in your life. When you step in into that canopy of blessing, you get blessed, your wife gets blessed, your husband gets blessed, your children get blessed, your grandchildren get blessed. Some of you are so blessed you got great grand. Your great grandchildren get blessed. Your business gets blessed. Your house gets blessed. Your hands get blessed. Everything you put your hands on is blessed because you're getting the blessing that God is putting upon the church because the church becomes a house of prayer for all nations. And that's what we see in Revelation 8. God takes the veil off and he says, I want you to see something. I know the angel came and stood at the altar holding, here we go, the altar holding a golden censer. And much incense was given to him that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints. Saints, it means all the separated ones who have been called of God. That's every single one of us and everyone else who given the light to Jesus. Listen to what he said. On the golden altar which was before the throne and the smoke of the incense ascended from the angel's hand with the prayers of the same before God. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and hurled it to the earth and there were pearls of thunder and sounds and flashes of lightning and an earthquake. I want you to listen. I want you to listen carefully. When you pray to God and you're in spiritual warfare, you're being attacked. How many of you have been attacked lately? Come on. You know it. When you begin to pray, God, amen, through his angel, they take that prayer. They take that incense. It's, it's, it's symbolic of something that is arising. And it's a sweet smelling incense. When the whole church comes together and we begin to pray, God, we're being attacked. The enemy is coming like a flood. The enemy is coming like a flood. The Bible says, amen, that God will begin to release what's in heaven because God is waiting on you when the church gets activated, when the church begins to move and pray. All of a sudden, what? They're attacking my son's fire. I love what one of our dear sisters shared yesterday during our prayer time. If you were not here yesterday for the prayer time that we have in, in English and Spanish, you missed out. But I love what she's praying and what the Lord revealed to her. He said, fire does not discriminate. And it begins to go loud. It begins to consume. I'm here to tell you when the fire of God begins to come, it begins to consume all darkness. Darkness has to flee. Darkness has to dispel. Things will begin to happen. Do I have anybody here who's ready to activate the Outro, the golden outro that God has given you to see the move of God. We had another brother who had a dream. And he, in our church, and, and, and he said that he saw us uh, in the church all the way in the roof. And I know what that meant. I did not know what the other part meant until I prayed. And the Lord revealed to me yesterday what it was. He said, we were all in the roof. And, and a roof signify high places. In the Bible, high places is the place where you either seek God. So here we are seeking the Lord, right? And then there was a flood that was coming. But as the flood came to the front of the church, there was a sinkhole. Oh, when the enemy comes like a flood, sometimes he raises a stand. But sometimes he sucks it all up. I don't care what you're saying against my son. It's not 
going to get through my children. Oh, I'm here to prophesy to somebody that has been going through battle. You've been going through struggle. God is saying, no matter how big the flood is coming your way, I am about to stop it. I am about to intervene. I am about to come and sabotage the saboteur in your life. Oh, that's enough for somebody here to give a shout to God and pump something and say, Lord, thank you. It's time to pray. Listen to me. Prayer, prayer is not the backup plan. Prayer is the plan. Prayer is not the plan. It's not the backup plan. Prayer is the battle plan. Prayer is not like a spare tire. That you only remember about your spare tire when you have a flat. Some of you treat prayer like that. Oh, I got a flat in my life. Do, 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 do. Let's call on Jesus. How would you like somebody calling you only when you need something? How many of you know people like that? They only, like, bro, you haven't come in 10 years? Now you call me? I experience that a lot. Because they, you know, they say, oh, you work for government. I, I, I need something. I haven't heard from you in 10 years. And all of a sudden, I, can you help me with this? I help them. But you know the feeling, right? Well, same thing with God. God wants you to have communion with him over and over and over again. I want you to start today, not tomorrow, today. I want every man, listen to me, to every man in this house. You are the spiritual father of your home. What you do affects everybody in your house. I don't care how chaotic it may feel right now, but you are the covering of your home. I want every man in this house. I don't care how new you are. You, you might be in the first day, but I want you to rise up today and say, I'm going to be the covering of my house. I'm going to become the prayer warrior. You might not even know how to pray, but you say, I'm going to learn how to pray. I'm going to be a mighty warrior. I'm going to be dressed for battle. I'm tired. I'm tired of my family getting hit. I'm tired of losing my kid. I'm tired of my family, my marriage falling apart. I'm going to pray. It's time to pray. Turn to at least three people and tell them it's time to pray. Prayerless Christians are powerless. Can I say that again? Prayerless Christians are powerless. The devil is laughing at your face. He looks at you and says, I got him. He got you busy. He got you distracted. He got you defiled. And he got you prayerless. And therefore, you're not a threat. But the moment, mm -mm -mm -mm, the moment you say, I'm going to start praying. And maybe you start with five minutes, and then you're going to go to ten minutes, and then you're going to pray 15 minutes, then you're going to pray half an hour, and then you're going to pray for an hour, and then you're going to break all the limitation. Then you're not going to stop. You're going to stop putting a clock in your girlfriend. Come on, somebody. You didn't put, baby, baby, don't go home. Just a little longer. It's, a, it's okay. I know it's three o'clock in the morning. But yet, when it comes to prayer, God is saying to you, if you seek me with all of your heart, you sh I shall be found. And you know what happens when God reveals himself? Your world changes. Everything around you change. How many are ready to pray like never before? How many are ready to say, I'm going to show up? Turn to at least three people and tell them, show up! Here's the last thing. Here's the last thing. I'm literally going to finish on time. Here's the last point that I want to give you. The last point. The Bible says in Isaiah 56, verse 6 through 7. And these I will bring to my holy mountain. Give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted in my altar. For my house, my house will be called a house of prayer for. Come on. For. For. 
is for all of the nations. I want you to understand that this is not just for one little group. You see, we were, we were those Gentiles. And now, not only can we get into the women's core and the men's core. Now, glory to God, the men doesn't have a place where women, come on, can't get in. Ladies, you've been given access to be right there, right next to the man. And to walk together into the presence of God. It's no longer ladies, you all the way over here and the men over here. The men get to do everything, the ladies don't get to do anything. I'm here to tell you, you can walk in there. You are priests in the Lord just like men are. You are kings uh, uh, just like men are. You are the intercessor just like men are. You have the sp same spiritual blessing. Don't have any ladies in this house They recognize nice that you have an identity and blessing that we men have as well we are blessed as a matter of fact now that we're all together we have a synergy that the enemy cannot contend with oh glory to God because now we have a covenant with God that's my last point you got to make a holy agreement that's what a covenant is it's a bonding you got to understand how powerful this is. God, sometimes people say, why God doesn't do this? God follows laws that he has implemented. And I'm here to tell you that when you enter into a holy agreement with God, that's what they did. He says, my house shall be called a house of a prayer for all of the nation. Because why? Jesus says, this is my blood. This is the covenant in my blood. And, and, and it's not just for, for the people of God at that time. It's for those who were not called out. The Bible says that every single one of us uh, got now get to be pulled in together. And now Jews and Gentiles that are in Christ, we get to praise God together. We get to pray together. We get to have breakthroughs together. We get to, because we have a holy agreement. See, the other side understands agreements. You ever seen those movies? Covenant? They're always about the dark side. They stole something from us. Because they understand this. Watch this. Unity is the platform for authority. I'm going to give you an example. Have you ever seen a husband and a wife fight with each other? Some of you are saying it all the time. <laughs> they're in disagreement. In front of their kids, they're disempowered. You saw that, right? Even though they have covenant, but they're not in agreement. They're not moving together. They're not flowing together. Why do you think the devil always fight, have you fighting with each other? Why did you come mad to church with each other? You can't because it's upon Sunday, but you're like, ah, leave me alone. <laughs> Don't touch me. <sighs> Don't look at me like that. Why? Why do you think that's happening? Because the enemy knows as long as he has you separated from a family. Listen, sons, daughters, why he wants you mad and angry at your parents? Why does he want you to be offended towards your parents? Why does he want you to say, oh, my parents didn't do this, didn't do that? Listen, you got a roof over your head, praise God. You got food, praise God. You got clothes, praise God. Because I could take you all over this world where kids were, didn't have a roof, didn't have breakfast, didn't have lunch, and maybe they have a little bread and garlic, and that was that was. The meal that they had. Can somebody say, I thank God for my parents? You said, but my parents were awful. Well, I'm here to tell you, you got a heavenly father. Praise be to God. And you pray for your father. And you pray that your dad will come to Jesus. My dad never told me that he loved me. But I pray for my dad. And I honor my dad through my prayer. And I said, I'm not going to give up on my dad. And I didn't let anybody get in the way between me and my dad. I pray, I pray, I pray. I will strike and strike and devil get a hand of my father. Lord, I pray for my father. And my dad gave his life to 
to Jesus. Do I have anybody here who's ready to honor, who's ready to enter into agreement, to ready to power up? I feel somebody's about to get power up in their marriage. Somebody's about to cancel the death. It's about to cancel the offense. It's about to let go. Let go. It's time to let it go. Let it go. And this Palm Sunday, let it go. Can somebody get up out of the seat and shout, I'm going to let it go. I'm letting go of all my sins. Some of you, you came to this church and you are angry at your previous church that you came. Maybe it was 20 years ago, but you're still carrying that stuff. Let it, turn to your neighbor and tell them, let it go. You're walking with that toxic. Don't defile us. Don't defile. We are all in the same covenant. And together, as we honor that covenant of the blood of Jesus, I'm here to tell you that no weapon formed against the church, the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the church. We're going to advance forward. We're going to keep winning soul. The captives are going to be set free. People are going to get healed. People are going to get set free. Your children shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. The heirs are going to be all rip open. Something is about to rip in this place. Hallelujah. Can somebody say hallelujah? Come on, somebody worship. 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 Lift up your hands. I'm glad that you received God's word today. But right now, I want to lead you to the greatest decision in your life. There's a decision to follow Jesus. To receive him as your Lord and Savior. I know what you're going to say. You're going to be like, but I, I don't know how to do that. Why don't I, I want to tell you that I want to lead you into prayer. It's a prayer of forgiveness where you're going to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life so he could change you and transform you. And you could become a child of God. There is no greater thing that could ever happen in your life and no greater difference making moment in your life than this one that is about to happen. So I, I want you to just pray this brief prayer and, and, and let it come from the bottom of your heart. I want you to pray, say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I repent and I turn to you for mercy and for grace. I receive you as my King and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. You're the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Let me tell you something. If you meant that, I want to encourage you to now Follow Jesus with all of your heart. Spend time with Him in prayer. Get a hold of a Bible. You can even get a Bible app nowadays and begin to grow and get connected to a church. If you don't have a home church, we want to invite you to new life. So I'm going to ask now Pastor Carlos to talk about uh, some of the great opportunities that we have here in New Life and how you can get connected at New Life Church. Thank you so much for joining us here, joining New Life Bronx. We are so glad that you tuned in to watch today. Know that if you want to join us in person and experience this in real life with other people here in our building, you can do so every single Sunday. Come on over to Morris Avenue in the Bronx, New York, where we are live every Sunday at 1045 a.m. in English and 12.30 p.m. in Spanish. If you want to know more about our services, about our small groups, conferences, and other things that we have going on in this community, you can catch our website on www.newlifebronx.com or you can do Instagram, Facebook, at 